Welcome to today's webinar on powering advanced application processors with Maxim's mobile high performance PMIX. I am Stan Bohenik. I'm part of Maxim's sales and applications teams here in San Jose. Joining us today, we have Gaurav Mattel from our mobile power business unit. And I've had the pleasure of working for Gaurav for many years. Uh, Gaurav is one of our mobile product definers. He is the brains behind the PMIX that we'll be discussing today, the Max 77863. With all of that out of the way, let's kick it off. Gaurav, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stan. So today what we're gonna go through is I'm gonna cover some details about the PMIC, you know, why a PMIC is so crucial for making a solution like this work, and uh, walk you through a demo which we have made, uh, which utilizes, uh, you know, a micro with, a, uh, with the PMIC, and, uh, and, and a lot more details about this exciting field. So there's a growing need for the edge computing for making real-time decisions like speech processing, that's with our AI assistance, uh, the object detection, right, with the security cameras or now even coming into a lot of our portable devices uh, where you want to see uh, what object is there, and also about visual 3D reconstruction, which is now getting uh, proliferated in our AR VR, VR devices. Now these devices or these systems have a building block. They all require application processors. They require uh, you know, a high speed memory access, IOs, high resolution cameras and displays. And what we need is to make these system work all together is you need very high performance regulators, which means high efficiency, excellent DC accuracy, and superior transient response. Now on the left, what I'm showing here is a battery powered system. So there is an AC cord because you need to charge your battery. So you have a charger module, you have a fuel gauge. Uh, the fuel gauge is really important to give you uh, a good sense of the health of the battery for the system. And here is the MAX 77863 PMIC. Now, this PMIC is, you see that there's a varying power or load requirements in the system. So a processing unit which has to make these real-time decisions requires a lot more current. That's where a dual phase is being used to power that. And then we have the single phase buck regulators to power the memory, the IOs, and other peripherals. There are also multiple LDOs, which are required for the noise sensitive rails. And you need a lot of handshaking. That's where uh, the GPIOs come very handy. So now this gives you an idea about what are the typical requirements for a system like this. So there are multiple ways to implement a power solution for a system. And I want to walk you through that why PMIC is an essential part, because you can always do, implement it using a discrete solution. Now, when you're making a system, uh, you, there's a majority of the applications, there's a space constraint PCB. You know, that means you required a power solution which is has a small footprint. Whereas you still have to meet all the other requirements of high performance regulators, uh, which means high efficiency and the low transient. So you need the full functionality, but you need to be able to implement all of it in a really small footprint. That's what PMIC enables you to do. Another critical thing is processors have, they mandate a glitch-free power up, power down sequence for successful boot up. And this applies for both over the temperature range, over your VN range. So if you have a discrete solution uh, and you know a microcontroller which has to control the enables for those discretes, you have to make sure about all the variabilities, which means that you'll end up over designing your circuit. So that's why having all it integrated with one brain, controlling all the timing, that's what PMIC enables you to do. And in a complex system, there's going to be a fault. You need a very robust fault detection. You need a very robust you know, fault response of making sure that as soon as you find out something goes wrong, there has to be a defined way how you respond to it. That means if a regulator in a PMIC or a power solution gets affected, you want to make sure that the SOC gets to know it as soon as possible. And hence, you want you know the interrupts and other things to make sure that it is robust. So the, again, a PMIC, having all of them being managed by this one logic helps you do that. With the high signal integrity requirements, 
again, the more you have it all compact together, the PMIC helps you get to that high signal integrity requirements for the system. Now, when you also look at it, if you make a discrete solution, right, uh, there are more discrete components, which means that you're more prone to assembly issues and again, also more inferior signal integrity. With one PMIC, you can make sure that all of it is intact in one place, right? So that reduces your chances of failures. Now, there's a lot of dynamic changes which are happening when the system is running, like you're changing output voltage of the regulators to go into different power modes. If you have discrete ICs, you have to manage them with different I2C addresses, which causes a congestion. Right. Now, if you have a congestion in the I2C, that means if there is something critical which is happening, going wrong, it may take a longer time for the SOC or the application processor to respond. And hence, that's why, again, having a PMIC to make sure that all of them are being controlled by this one solution makes it very critical. So all of these put together give you a good idea about why implementing a complex system like this with a PMIC is essential. Yeah, so, so I want to give just a real quick idea of um, kind of a market example to give a little bit more complex uh, context to everybody as to what's really driving the market and the opportunity here. So um, the devices, the autonomous machines, you can get a sense from one of Maxima's partnerships and, and customers, NVIDIA. They have this uh, example that, uh, Gaurav, you're going to be talking about, you know, some of the, the demos that we have that are on this platform using the Jetson platform. Um, they offer this robust family of AI solutions, and these are software-defined solutions with hardware-ready development kits uh, and production-ready modules that they call Jetson. So companies will take um, and look at Jetson because it gives them a, a very high level of performance and power efficiency and ease of development that allows them to design cutting edge solutions that get to, to market very fast. And you'll, you'll notice that from a market standpoint, uh, it's kind of across the board. You'll see that these kind of intelligent devices are impacted in almost every industry. Um, NVIDIA actually gives some examples. They say 10% of the manufacturing tasks today are automated. So there's a huge upside. Now using GPUs and AIs and uh, NVIDIA's customers have that path to be able to take on that remaining 90%. So they've seen early success with examples like robotics and aerospace, healthcare, uh, smart cities, think inspection, you know, all the drone opportunities. And it kind of makes sense that the early adopters um, were in the commercial and this industrial space, space because these apps are kind of focused on very capital intensive edge operations. And so, you know, solving their customers' problems here saves a lot of money, right? But there's also a, a major need for AI on this mass market uh, devices as well. So really this is that significant uh, edge and mobile opportunity. So they give examples, NVIDIA does, and I was doing some research uh, prior to this that more than 200 million video streams in consumer and retail and commercial applications aren't being processed today. And then there's over a trillion manufactured products that require visual inspection. And even in the home, uh, you'll, you'll see that Americans spend hundreds of billions of hours on household chores every year. And each one of these opportunities has an area that could be um, uh, that we could actually affect with AI solutions. So these are full AI systems, not merely just devices. Uh, so there's price sensitivity and today's hardware just wasn't up to, uh, to, to the challenge. And so that's where you'll see this opportunity for the Jetsons of the world uh, to address this market. And, and also, you know, all these low power AI solutions are, you know, really have a, a major opportunity. So, Gaurav, you mentioned um, that, you know, software certainly had, plays a huge role in these autonomous machines. But hardware is a critical ingredient at the core of every system. And so with so many applications and use cases, um, I, I know that you can explain where Maxim's flexible power solutions are, are a perfect fit. So I'd like you to do that. Perfect, Stan. This was a very good explanation about why it's, it's a very true statement about uh, things are changing at such a fast pace and these systems are allowing us to do or make intelligent decisions. Right. And that's why we chose this as a demo uh, in where, you know, made a demo with the Maxim PMIC, which is a, ch a chosen solution for a Jetson Nano, uh, showcasing that how this palm sized device, you know, uh, is able to make so many real time decisions. And it's so easy to develop and showcase like how, you know, you can leverage the whole processing power, uh, which is available to you.
And so in this demo, it's basically, you know, we're showing, we were able to prove how the high system efficiency with our PMIC, uh, also being able to, you know, give 25 watt output power, which is uh, sufficient for this one small device, uh, but highly capable. And also because it's a small solution, you know, the size of the PMIC and the total solution size is so critical. So keeping all of this in mind, that's where we chose this platform to showcase all the benefits what our Maxim PMIC does. So here you see that the Jetson Nano is a single board computer that brings the power of modern artificial intelligence into a small, easy to use platform, right? Uh, it packs a 128 core NVIDIA Maxim, Maxwell GPUs, quad core CPU, and also you know, four GB of LPDDR memory, right? So you see that it's, a, it's got a significant amount of power uh, built into it, which has to be now, you need a good power solution to be able to make it respond and given our expected results, right? So these devices are also not just for professional developers looking to make large scale commercial products. It's also aimed for the students and enthusiasts uh, with interest in machine learning and robotics. And this particular, uh, you know, device, the Jetson Nano, uh, gives you a very easy interface with the keyboard, mouse, you have the uh, a camera which can be plugged in uh, and allows you to make advantages of this whole embedded applications on this AI platform. Right? So this is showing you what we did uh, on our side at Maxim, right? So our apps team was able to very easily to pick up, you know, open the box, take out this thing, uh, the the module, put in our peripheral, which is the camera, and start building on it, right? There are a lot of open source material which is available. So, uh, you know, our app team, we were all able to build it up, start on with an open source code, make changes to it, and then showcase what we wanted to do. In this particular case, what we were doing is human detection, right? So the camera was opened up, you know, you have it in a conference room, and whenever people walk through or walk close to the camera, it'll identify how many humans there are, right? Now, it's not just about identifying what the right source is. It's also about rejecting what is not fitting uh, the criteria, right? So you see that amount of processing which is required, uh, which means that you have to identify a person that, yes, this is a true use case or a true uh, human versus, you know, you have a chair or you have uh, uh, a table and it has rejected. So all these real-time detection and analysis was going on with this particular platform. Right? And we were able to deploy uh, and able to also you know, have it over the network, showing that uh, storing data on it and being able to like in this room, how many people entered, how many uh, you know, exited, how many people were there at the same time. Right? Now you see that you have now the processor, you have the PMIC, you're doing all of this interaction, all of this made made available uh, with the PMIC. So this is the PMIC. Now this showcases you what are the resources required. Uh, so we have buck regulators, which are you know, powering your SOCs and the IOs and the memories. Uh, we need a lot of handshaking. So this PMIC, you see have eight GPIOs which lets you do a lot of IO interaction with the SOC and other blocks, right? Uh, there's an RTC block. We have multiple LDOs, which allow you to interface with these cameras, which are noise sensitive. So you want to make sure that you're able to capture the device or the image properly and then make decisions. There are uh, enable signals. There are a lot of control signals which are required to say, when there's a fault condition or when I'm reaching, you know, full power uh, utilization and other responses. Now, I'm talking about all these, but one thing I also want you to focus on is there are so many things which you will see regarding the resources, the power flexible uh, requirements and uh, the handshaking. But there are also other things which are required for enhanced system performance, which the PMIC allows you to do. One is the MON, which is our battery monitor pin. Okay, now this PMIC uh, gives you a heads up 
right? So whenever you're doing so much processing, that means you're going to have a lot of current being drawn. And because of the PCB drops, the V in the input voltage can drop uh, and go closer to a shutdown state, right? But you don't want to hit that. So we give you a warning statement or a warning signal, which allows the SOC to respond. So the, what the battery monitor does is that it is a programmable threshold, which gives you a, a warning that your input voltage is going, you know, lower and lower, and you may want to change the performance, right, to make sure that you don't shut down the system when it goes below your under voltage. This becomes very handy uh, in making when you have a really high power computation going on. The other one is an RTC alarm. So to be in cases where you have, you want really long standby current, and hence you want to shut down as much uh, of the power hogging uh, blocks as possible. So even from the IO point of view, you want to uh, turn off your I2Cs, you want to turn off your controllers, my, your uh, you know, voltage monitors as much as you can so that you can have a longer standby uh, playtime. And what this RTC alarm helps you to do is that you program the RTC alarm thresholds that after maybe three hours or maybe uh, after knowing or learning your customer use cases, you would know that the customer does not use this for a specified amount of time, maybe for you know 12 a.m. 12 a. to 6 a.m. right? And hence, you want to be in the lowest powering mode, but you still want to keep it on. Right. You can have these RTC alarms built in, which will automatically come without any other interface to wake up the PMIC, check how things are going, and then again go back to sleep. Uh, having a 32 kilohertz out. Now, having one clock source for the whole system is highly beneficial because uh, it's very easy to synchronize your whole system. And what this PMIC allows you to do because we have a crystal oscillator for the RTC block, we also give out these 32 kilohertz out, which can be used for synchronizing other blocks in your system. Right. Having flexible outputs for uh, external regulators, so you can enable and disable them, that becomes very useful, right? And also entering and exiting sleep mode, right? So uh, I just need one pin where I have some of the resources which are on, but in sleep state, I would want to turn off majority of them so I can save power and then wake up again when activity is required. So that can also be done with an enable one pin right, on the PMI. Now, al uh, along with these you know, logics and other control systems, definitely performance of a PMI is critical. What I'm showcasing here is the three most important uh, you know, characteristics which are being evaluated for a buck regulator, which is an efficiency, uh, you would have a DC accuracy and also load regulation and the load transients, right? And you see that the performance over here, we're definitely targeting and getting more than 90% efficiency for a 1.2 volt rail, which is typically like an SOC rail, uh, which is required, uh, which also now has very tight load regulation requirements uh, because you know, with the, the technology moving towards a smaller geometry, the guard band or the band of uh, the output voltage deviations are becoming tighter. Hence, you want a very high or very good DC accuracy with it, which again uh, means also for the load transients that you need a very tight response uh, when load transients are applied on your system. So this PMIC has very good uh, characteristics and hence that's where it's able to, uh, you know, perform all these uh, activities for the SOC. Now, I've done a lot of discussion about this one particular PMIC, which is the MAX 77863, but we have a lot more products in our portfolio. And the, the next one which I would talk about is the 77714, right? And this one is, I would say, a little lighter on power requirements or power delivery because uh, this one does not have a dual phase, has a single phase. So there are a lot of systems which would require a lot more power, like an eight amp. That's where I would recommend a max 77863. But there are also smaller modules, uh, which don't need the eight amps. They need like four amps, right, for your core processor. And that's where you can 
optimize your power solution and choose the right PMA. And similarly, again, you have the Max 7752. Right? These are all products which are available, uh, and you can, you know, check the details out on our website. Now, when you're designing a complex system like this, you definitely need a lot of design resources. When I say design resources, that's a skew of things. Like there is a detailed, uh, you know, data sheet which calls out all our, uh, you know, software bits, our performance criteria, our TOC, which is the typical operating characteristics. But we also give you a lot of design solutions, which means that we are recommending you how to think about implementing your power solution. Right? Which also means that when you're designing your system, not all your requirements have been uh, frozen. So our EV kits are designed in a way which gives you a, a lot of flexibility, which means that you can change your output voltages. We give you an onboard load cells. So you can try out different use cases on our EV kit standalone so that you have a very good idea about how to optimize it, right? And then you can go about optimizing your layout once you've made those decisions. And the GUI, which we have, allows you to do all these flexibility and also allows you to write a script. So if you want that I want to change my output voltage after a certain amount of time, or I want to change, uh, toggle my pins, uh, after a certain amount of time on a GPIO or a enable pin, a script allows you to do that. So all of this put together shows you that how we give you all the tools required to make sure that you're able to try out all different scenarios on our EV kit. The load cells gives you the capability of applying a four amp load without requiring external components, right? So all that is built in on the EV kit, right? Also, Taking a step forward, once you've decided how you want to use the PMIC, we also provide you a lot of tools for giving you the cadence-based uh, you know, package information. And also uh, regarding how the pinout has to be and how a symbol has to be, you can start using it directly from our website. So all put together, you see that uh, providing you recommendations, giving you the tools to make sure that you can try out all your use cases and also how do you start your layout and giving a recommendation on layouts. All that, all of that comes with our solution. Excellent. So, so we can now get into the Q and A, but actually before I do Q and A, I'm going to drag my questions over here so I can see them. So there've been a number of questions, a few questions, actually a couple more just came in um, that I can bring to you, Gaurav. So somebody's asking a question about uh, PMIX solutions with higher system power. So in your presentation, I remember that, that you had mentioned that the PMIC can deliver up to 25 watts. So I guess the question is, is when you have a system power that's in excess of that, um, how, how do you handle that? Is there, you know, I guess the question is, is there an upper end a limit? That's a good question. So the PMIC uh, is very scalable. What I mean by that is uh, the PMIC is powering a part of the module right, in a bigger, let's consider a big system, like a 100 watt system, right? And you have a very high processing power GPU and CPU, right? And how that kind of solution will be implemented is that uh, when you have such high power, you don't want all the power to be at one place. It's good to fragment it, okay? Which means that resources which require 25 amps of current, the recommendation is to keep them as close as possible to your source, right, or to your load system. And, but you want to make sure that all of this, the extra multi-phase bucks which are being used to power your GPU and CPUs are still controlled by the PMIC. And that's where we have the GPIO pins which control the enable and disable of these external regulators. So your timing point of view, your brain still is on the PMIC and it's able to uh, scale for different power requirements and controlling it with the GPIOs. So that's how uh, the, the whole power solution can be done with the PMIC, which also brings up a good, uh, very important point, is that you want to reuse the firmware as much as possible, right? So once you design in this PMIC on one platform and because it's scalable, you don't have to change the firmware, which is a big bliss for the firmware team 
because they spend a lot of time in developing that. So from even from the firmware, you just have this one block, one PMIC, which is for your smaller platforms, the whole power source for your SOC and memory. And for larger systems, it, it starts controlling the additional bugs or external bugs with the GPIO pins for enabling and disabling them. So that's how uh, it will be implemented uh, on a power. And yes, there is no real upper limit on this uh, because you can uh, have multiple different regulators being controlled by the PMA. Okay, excellent. Um, another question that's coming in about the default operating conditions. So the question was, um, how are the PMIC default operating conditions set and can they be programmed at the customer end? Sure. So the default programming, we, we spell that out in our data sheet about the versions which are available for you to readily you know, get off the shelf, just buy them. So, and they have been programmed a certain way. If that particular condition works for you, perfect, right? Now, if th there are multiple scenarios. One scenario is that you still power up the system and you have a way like a housekeeping microcontroller to come and change the settings before you power up the chip. That is, or wake up the chip. That is another way. Uh, or the, the other way is that Maxim will work with you to have a defined uh, default state which matches your requirements. And that programming will be done at Maxim. Uh, you would not be able to do it at your end uh, as a default. So that will be an interaction which will be with you and with Maxim, and we would create a version for you. Okay. Um, there's a question about the solution size. Now, they're actually asking for the solution size, specifically this PMIC. I, I do recall that you had that somewhere in the presentation, so you can certainly answer that question, but maybe it kind of begs the question, um, this versus discrete. Uh, any, any idea of what that delta is? Sure. So the, the PMIC solution size, uh, in a typical solution, you would use at least 70 to 80%, if not 100, right? Person of the resource of the PMIC. So uh, based on the analysis, our, if you're using 70 to 80% of our resources, we can range about from like 70 millimeter square uh, solution all the way to like 110 millimeter square. Uh, this also I'm keeping in mind about the inductor which is chosen uh, because that plays a big role in uh, you know, in the efficiency of the buck regulator. So it's in the range of 70 millimeter to, if you use bigger inductors, can go up to like 100 millimeter, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're implementing the same solution with a discrete, we are about 70, uh, about 50, 60, 50 to 60% smaller in solution size because what happens, which you have to keep in mind, is there is a keep out space for every chip which you are putting on a board. Right. So if you have a chip, you have a keep out space rules which are required for your PCB layout. And that's where we get a big benefit. And about 60 to 50 to 60% savings comes with our PMIC on space. Okay, excellent. Uh, we got a question here about syncing buck regulators with external frequency. Um, I guess the question is, is that possible? Hmm. On this particular PMIC, we uh, do not allow uh, external frequency to be synced for the buck regulators. Uh, we have a two megahertz clock frequency, which is done, done on the buck regulators. And uh, so in short, we do not allow uh, the syncing feature. Or we okay. don't support the syncing feature. Um, here's, another question. here's another question about enabling uh, the system, so the, what are the options to enable the system uh, if they don't have a user or interface like a push button? I guess, are they talking about like a power button? Hmm, true. So some of our handheld devices have a push button, like even our cell phones have a push button to turn on the screen or turn on the device. Uh, but there are also a lot of devices which are always plugged in, which don't have a user interface uh, push button, uh, you know, to wake it up. So uh, what we allow is that this particular PMIC can detect uh, like a charger or a DC source plugin and use that as a input source or a wake up signal for waking up the PMIC and hence the system, right? So there are multiple different wake up sources which are uh, detected by our PMIC. Some of them as we're talking about is a push button. Some of it is like you just plug in a power source uh, and it can use that uh, to wake up the system. So yes, it's it's very versatile. 
uh, and very flexible to yeah, very accommodate flexible. different makeup cycles. Um, next question, you talked about regulator faults. Uh, we're asking if there's any mechanisms that the PMIC has when a system has hangups. Okay, so, uh, yes, so yes, so from the system point of view, the regulators are big, play a big role, but there's also cases like what happens if the microcontroller who is deciding on how to react fails, right? Then uh, you can be in a hang up situation, right? And that is what uh, the PMIX, uh, the Maxim PMIX, we have a system watchdog timer, uh, which, you know, which allows you to reset your system if you do if you figure out that the micro is hung up which means that a system watchdog timer what it does is that it mandates the microcontroller or the processor to keep writing to one of the bits periodically and if it's not able to write to that bit which means that uh, there is something which might have gone wrong and hence i should react so the pmic takes charge and does the system reset Right, so that is one part of it. The other one can also be an I2C based hangup, that you have a lot of these I2C transactions which are going on between uh, the different blocks. And what if the I2C itself hangs up? So we also have a watchdog timer uh, or a mechanism in our PMIC to detect that and come out of it. So yes, we have a lot of different ways to avoid the system hangups built in into the PMIC. Okay, excellent. I'm going to skip ahead and actually combine a couple of questions because they're kind of similar. Somebody's asking about models, somebody's asking about drivers. So do you, or do we provide a behavior model for the PMIC and somebody else is asking for a Linux driver? Sure. So we totally understand the requirement and need of, you know, the end or the development team. Uh, for having drivers. So yes, we do support the Linux kernel drivers for PMIX and that can be found on our GitHub website, right? Uh, from behavioral point of view, uh, we do not provide uh, a behavioral model for the PMIC, uh, but we give you a lot of collateral uh, from our TOCs and also from our bench testing, which are included in our uh, data sheets to help you answer a lot of your questions and also giving you a recommendation on the programming of how you should program the system the resource pages. Okay, excellent. Um, we've got a number of questions that have also come in, but um, we're gonna end with just one more. So let me rephrase this question. Um, so we started the beginning of the presentation with a very specific partner example. And so somebody's asking, can this PMIC be used for different uh, system on chip or SOC architecture, or is it limited to uh, particulars? Huh. Uh, that's also a very good question because uh, now a lot of the building blocks in these kind of systems, you take any processor, are on the similar lines. Right, they all have the requirement of the processing unit, memory, IOs, and also interacting with the peripherals, right? But definitely the current requirements or the voltages are more optimized for the application. Like you may require a lot higher current for a graphic intensive or a computation intensive, uh, you know, application, uh, whereas a little bit lower current for a not so called computation intensive. Uh, but because the building blocks are very similar and uh, our PMIC, we build in the flexibility into that, which means that we give you a wide range of output voltage which can be supported by a buck regulators. We give you, you know, access to different wake up signals or polarities, which may be required for active high, active low. Uh, we give you options for doing a DVS feature with our GPIOs. And uh, also with a highly configurable range of uh, LDOs. So we built in a lot of flexibility, keeping all of this in mind uh, because it's a complex system and things keep changing. And even you find out things later in the stage of your development. So that's the whole reason why we built in a lot of flexibility uh, to accommodate uh, these changes. So these PMICs are very versatile. They're not uh, targeting only one kind of application, they can be used for a very wide range of processors or applications uh, available. Thank you.
Oh, excellent. Okay. So any additional questions we will answer uh, via email. I know that you and the team will be able to get back to them. So that, that's all the time that we have uh, today. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, thank you, Gaurav, uh, for your presentation. And um, last couple of points. At the conclusion of this webinar, you are going to see a window that will give you an opportunity to request a customer meeting. So hopefully you can take advantage of that. And so I should say uh, thank you very much for your interest in Maxim. We hope everybody has a great day. Any last words, Gaurav? Oh, thank you so much for listening. And I'm like, I'm very interested to know your use cases and help you uh, design your system. So looking forward. All right. Excellent. Have thank a great you. day.